I want to introduce our speaker for this morning, who is Jonathan um, Chaffee, Reverend Jonathan Chaffee, who's a member of this congregation. Um, he's also the chief chaplain for the RAF. Um, he lives in High Wycombe with his wife, Jane, who is also ordained. And um, he's been all around the world in the last month and uh, has been doing all kinds of um, challenging things, which you might like to ask him about later. And uh, one of the ways that we can help him on his front line is to pray for him um, in his work um, in, in the very public role that he holds in the RAF. But he um, is also a brother in our church family, and he's here to preach for us this morning. And before he speaks, Zeke is going to come and uh, read our reading. Over to you, Zeke. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things that have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Sorry, I'm not quite prepared here. <laughs> he finished slightly before I would have done. Can you hear me from this? No? No? Can you hear me now? Okay. How are you, sis? Yes, have you ever heard that expression, there's something wrong with this microphone? And the congregation said, and also with you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Right. I think there's something wrong with me. Uh, as we were worshipping this morning, I, I was reminded of, uh, of a man in 1944, 1945, who was imprisoned uh, in Germany for his work as a pastor and as a theologian in Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you may have known of him. Uh, and Bonhoeffer... Uh, wrote some wonderful letters and poems. I haven't got the poem I'm thinking of in front of me, but I'm going to paraphrase it uh, as we begin in the prayer. So let's, let's just concentrate and listen. It, the poem's called, Who Am I? Who am I? The guards tell me that I walk with confidence, with calmness, like a squire before his captors? Am I that which other men speak of, or am I that which I know of myself, restless and longing and sick like a bird in a cage? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine, but whatever I am, thou knowest, O Lord, I am thine. Father, whatever state we have been in, we thank you that in Christ all things are made new and that you give us an identity that can never be shaken, never taken away, both now and for eternity. So help us to understand it and so understanding to live it that the word made flesh may become real in us and through us. Amen. You, you may have heard the expression, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I first heard it about 30 years ago at a time when stories were coming out of the underground churches in Eastern Europe of many Christians in, who were uh, being very courageous in the face of persecution. 
Now, we know that opposition to the Christian faith is still around today. It hasn't gone away. And in some parts of the world, it can cost you your job. It can cast you out of your family. And it can even take your life. As we know from reports of atrocities from extremists across North Africa, Iraq and Syria, as well as elsewhere. And in our own land, we may not have that same physical violence and threat, but there is a battle for the place of the Christian faith in our society, in our marketplace, in our public life. And there is a need to teach even the very basics of our faith in our schools and our homes. And therefore it's so important that Christians should stand up and be counted. The following Uh, 1059 services beyond this week will be addressing some of the ways that we can do that. It's about letting our faith translate into every area of our lives, whole life, discipleship, whether it's into our work, as we heard from Wendy in her work in the school, the Brownies, Lighthouse, amongst other things, in our homes and our domestic relationships in our ambitions and our concerns, our lifestyle, our wallets and purses. It's about being natural and intentional in sharing our faith through the way we live, the service we offer. But in order to do that, rather like in a, being in a court of law, giving the evidence We need to be convinced of our uh, position and possession. Otherwise, our testimony is at best unstable or at worst completely undermined. So what do we stand for? And is your faith and mine built on solid ground? And today's reading from Scripture helps us. Uh, Let's have, could we have the first of those two slides, the start of that reading? It's part, the the letter to Colossians, it's part of a letter written by St. Paul, who was himself probably at this time under house arrest in Rome. And it's to Colossae, a town on the coast of modern western Turkey. And the purpose of the letter, and its purpose also for us, is that we may appreciate our identity in Jesus and the freedom and the responsibilities that that inheritance brings. So on the one hand, our identity, who we are in Jesus, or in Paul's words, in Christ. Christ means the anointed one. You could juxtapose that with Jesus in the New Testament writings. Who we are in Christ, in Jesus, and secondly, what the consequences are, how we therefore can live that out in our lives. And today's reading concentrates on the identity. The next couple of weeks or so, looking at other passages of the New Testament, will look concentrate on the ensuing opportunities and challenges and, and responsibilities. But first things first, only when we know what we stand for, when we're sure of our foundations, can we build our house. Only, know, only when we know what we are about can we live out the consequences. So, what is our identity in Christ as Christians? And if you look at that reading, and for those of you who've got Bibles there, if you wanted to look at it in the Bible, it's on page 214 of the church Bibles. Paul highlights the supremacy of Jesus. We heard about that just before our reading. The supremacy of Jesus over all creation, over everything. There is nothing over which Jesus is not Lord. Whether ruler or authority, any power on earth, not nature, nothing is absent from his lordship. He is the word of God through which the Father spoke at the beginning of creation. All things created through him and for him. This means that he is not absent. 
He's not like an absentee landlord, or as uh, Dave described last week, St. Paul walking through Athens, looking at all the different statues of various gods. They even had one to an unknown god, because they wanted to hedge their bets. He says he's not like that in stone. He is real, and he's genuinely involved in human life, and we cannot afford to ignore him. I, I heard this morning, very sadly, of a uh, uh, that the brother of a friend of mine had died and uh, just recently. And over the last few weeks, he wanted to, s- to see lots of people that were very important to him. And the one thing he said constantly be- the day before he died was, Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. He is over everything. He is in all things. We cannot afford to ignore him. Now, many of you know that I am a chaplain in the armed forces, and one of the things we do at church services is often bring one of the squadrons or regiment standards or colours into church. And we would... I haven't got one with me. It doesn't work like that. I can't just borrow one. And uh, we would bring it into church... And or on a parade square, you make what we call a drumhead service, so some drums, and you lay it on the drums, which count like an altar. And we would put it on the altar, lay it down the front. I remember once a four-star American general being amazed by this because they have such a separation of church and state in America. They couldn't do that. But we do that regardless of what you think about church and state. What that symbolizes is a temporal and spiritual loyalty at the heart of our national life. A loyalty to the Queen and a loyalty to God. And also, beyond that still, it shows that God is involved in human life. So at the centre of a public service for the armed forces, we lay a standard on an altar as a sign that God is there doesn't mean that God's on our side. It means that God is there and we're called to be faithful to him as well as to what we're called to do in the armed forces. And it was because, it, it, it means that God is there in all the murkiness, in all the difficulty. And I wonder if you know that even in your own experience in life, that God is there in all the loose threads, in all the joys, and in all the sorrows, in all the complexities, in all your concerns, the myriad nature of your life, God is interested, he is involved. And where it's all broken, he wanted to make it right. And that's why if we go to the next half of the reading, the top line of this, if you can read it, or you'll find it in verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. God became flesh. The word at the beginning of creation became flesh, like you and me in first century Palestine. He wanted to make it right because he loves us so much. And we're made in his image, even though we go astray. And so Jesus' mission was very simply to reconcile creation, including us, to God. Not just for now, but for eternity. Now, of course, there was and there is plenty of evidence to convict us of what we've done wrong. But the cross, if you think of the word sin, the cross literally crosses out the I in sin. (laughs) And the irony is that if you take that court of, uh, that justice court analogy, Jesus as the judge actually took our place in the dock. He took the sin of the world on him. And that means that whatever we have done and whatever baggage we carry, we can place it at the foot of the cross and walk free. That's why I was thinking of Bonhoeffer this morning. That he he wasn't perfect by any stretch, but he knew where he stood, who wherever I am, whatever I am, Thou knowest, O God, I am thine, I am yours. Or as our song put it before, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
Our identity as Christians is in Jesus and therefore we can walk free, we can walk tall, for we are new creations, holy in his sight. That's very good news. But it's, there's even more good news than that. And that is that it's available for everyone, not just for us here in church. If we want to share it with others, we need to know that it's there for us first. And note the last line of that reading. Strange in a sense that he should add that. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. Paul included that comment for two reasons. First, if he, who was initially the feared persecutor of the church, could become a Christian, then anyone can. You may have members of your family that you think are beyond the pale. You may have members in your community, friends, work colleagues. They can become Christians. That's the sheer transformative power of God's love and work in Jesus. And if anyone here is still uncertain about where they stand in Jesus, then do speak with someone after the service who will help you place your feet very squarely on the cross of Christ. There's no time like the present. And secondly, Paul includes that comment because with that identity, there comes a vocation, a call, a challenge, a responsibility. I, Paul, became a servant of this good news. And that's the same for us, that the words we say on a Sunday must be put into practice on a Monday. Or as another saying puts it, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. The next few weeks we'll focus on how we do that. Today is about the foundations, about our inheritance, our identity. And that through, as the song put it, through all the storms of our lives, we can rest on the grace and mercy of Jesus. He's also the head of the church, and as the body of Christ, we support each other as well. And I'd like to really just uh, leave you today with one illustration of that. Forgive all the military analogies, it just comes naturally to me. But this, this week, I met the son of uh, an RAF chaplain from the Second World War. And uh, he's been sorting out some of his father's possessions. He came across this box. Now, his father uh, was a chaplain in Singapore. Didn't work out well, as you can imagine. And he chose not to be uh, rescued, but to go with prisoners, to stay behind when the Japanese ran it over. And from 1942 to 45. He was a prisoner of war, interned in the Japanese camps. Uh, And he wrote constantly letters to the authorities to argue for services to be held publicly in these camps. Uh, And they refused all the time. Uh, But in the secret areas of the camp, they made uh, a small cross out of metal. It's not straight, it's a bit crooked, but the cross is not a pretty thing. But that was so important to them that they made one secretly for secret services that they held in the camps. He also made, uh, got made in the camp, you can't really see this, it's uh, a little box with the cross on top and the cross around the side. They carved this. Uh, it's uh, a box in which you put little wafers for communion. And amazingly, uh, 70 years on, when it may be an original one, there's a wafer inside that this chap discovered. Uh, And that was so important to them that they were prepared to risk suffering in the camps for it. And uh, this chap, Alan Giles, Padre Giles, was thrown in the cooler for his work into solitary confinement for some time because of this. And he chose only to be there, remember, to serve others and to help them see what they could be in Christ. And that even in the darkness of a prison camp, Jesus was present. And the work on the cross 
transforms lives even in the darkest of places. And this symbol of our communion with Jesus that we have when we take bread and wine, it's a symbol that it's always there for us, whatever our situation. So I want to leave you with that. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. And our communion with him is there for all time. Our commission then is to take it to others. Amen. Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan was just speaking about the there's no time like the present. And um, this week, I met a friend of mine who lives in Burundi, who, who is um, a preacher out there. And he told us a story of how he went to preach in a village in Burundi near the Congolese border. And um, he was saying exactly that to them. There is no time like the present. You don't know what the future holds. You might think you have um, all the time in the world. But today is the day to decide about God. And um, they weren't interested. And he rode off on his motorbike. And two days later, he thought he'd go back and see if he could speak to them again. And the road was blocked. And uh, he asked the army officers, why have you blocked the road? And he said, that entire village has just been wiped out. They're all dead. And it just reminded me, you know, we live as, we, we live as if we're going to live forever. But we don't know if we will. And I just wonder if there you know, are some people who, like me, listening to Jonathan, think, yeah, I need to decide. I need to resolve how I'm going to live my life because um, I don't know how much of it I've got left. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? So I thought, let's just um, have a moment of quiet as we, uh, we ponder what Jonathan has said and on what foundations we're living our lives. Now I'm going to lead us in in a prayer of commitment, which silently you can make your own if you want to. Father, I am sorry that I have withheld so many things from you. Thank you that on the cross you have done it all and you have made a foundation on which my life can be built. Please take all of me, all that I am, all that I have, all that remains of my life. And please lead me in being your disciple, your servant. In Jesus' name. Amen.